Hello and welcome to Electromagnetics 1. This is lecture number 9. Today we're going to be talking about uh, something called boundary conditions. Specifically we're going to be talking about boundary conditions um, on the electric field and we'll also talk about some boundary value problems. Well if the electric field exists in a region consisting of two different media the equations that the field must satisfy at the interface separating the media are called boundary conditions. Up to this point in the course we've been talking primarily about um, an electric field in a, a uniform medium. In other words, where the, the material parameters are, are constant throughout the region. Now we want to see um, what, uh, what equations uh, does the electric field have to satisfy at the boundary between, for instance, two different dielectrics. Okay. So we're going to be talking about um, specifically the boundary conditions on the electric field in this lecture. There are also boundary conditions that govern the magnetic field, and we'll talk about that um, later in the course. Well, let me turn your attention here to um, figure one. Uh, this is a, a figure that shows a boundary uh, between regions that have um, two different uh, permeabilities here. This, this region has a perme permeability epsilon sub 1 and um, this region has permeability epsilon 2. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we would like again to try to decide um, what, what boundary conditions does the electric field satisfy right here along this interface between the two media. Let's start, uh, let's start our discussion with Faraday's law. This is the differential form here of Faraday's law. And I'd like you to notice that um, I've made no uh, static assumptions here. In other words, this is neither the electrostatic nor the magnetostatic case. This is the, the um, most general case where we allow the fields to um, vary as a function of position and of time. So there may be an electric field in the region. It may vary as a function both of, um, I should say, there may be an electric field in the region. It, it may vary as both a function of position and time. There may also be a magnetic field in the region uh, that may vary as a function of position and time. Okay, so here we go. This is the this is a Faraday's law in differential form, and I'm going to integrate both sides of this equation over a surface S. Okay, so just simply integrating this side over surface S and this side over surface S. I can apply Stokes' theorem to the left-hand side of this equation. So Stokes' theorem says that um, the integral over a surface area of the curl of a vector field is equal to that vector field integrated along the line bounding that surface area. Okay. So left-hand side here becomes the circulation of the electric field and then the right-hand side we have this surface integration of the time derivative essentially of the magnetic field times this constant mu naught. Well, um, let's integrate this equation here, this, this equation here along the contour shown in figure 1a. Okay, so on the left hand side here, we're going to allow L to be this contour, and we're going to allow S to be the area inside that contour here on the right hand side. Okay, And again we're going to play the game um, that says that these these dimensions are becoming quite short so we can make approximations that um, the field along this line is more or less constant. All right. So um, if you look at the left hand side of this equation here it breaks down into a number of components when we integrate along this contour in this in this direction. All right. the, first, um, the first component here is um, due to the integration along this path that gets us the tangential component of the electric field I should say along, along this path, excuse me, that gets me the tangential component of the electric field in region 1, that's this term. Okay. If you'll notice here um, we've, we've divided uh, the electric field in region 1 into a component that's normal to the surface, in other words at 90 degrees to the surface, and a component that is tangential to the surface, Okay, in other words is tangent to the surface at that point. 
we've done the exact same thing here with the electric field in, in region 2. We've divided into a component that is at 90 degrees to the interface and a component that is along the interface, the so-called tangential piece. Okay? And at every point along this interface, we can, we can de decompose the field into a tangential and normal component. So that's all we're doing right here in this region. So the integration in this line integral along this line gets me the tangential component of the electric field because of this dot product with dl times delta w, this length. All right, then the contribution um, to the integral along this part gets me minus the normal component times this length, that's delta h over 2. This piece gets me minus the um, normal component in region 2 times delta h over 2. Then we have another section along this long piece here that is minus the um, tangential component of the electric field in region 2 times this distance, delta w. Then we have contribution along that piece, which is the normal com component of the electric field in region 2 times that distance, delta h by 2. And finally, the contribution along that little piece, which is the normal component of the electric field in region 1 times this little distance, delta h over 2. Okay. So the, all of those, the sum of those pieces is the line integral of the electric field around that contour. And then on the right hand side, on the right hand side, um, we need to do the integral of the time derivative of the magnetic field um, dotted with a little differential surface area. Okay. And we're going to integrate over this entire surface. This, this, the, or should I should say this surface bounded by this contour. Okay. Well, let's call the let's call the component of the magnetic field that is um, at 90 degrees to this surface. In other words, that's normal to this surface h sub u. So that's what this is. We're going to say that's the component of the magnetic field that's normal to the surface and along um, ds. All right. So this integration becomes Again, if we, if we make the approximation that h sub u is constant over the surface area, it just simply becomes the time derivative of h sub u times the surface area, delta h times delta y. Okay. Well, if we allow delta h to go to 0, in other words, if we allow this dimension to go to 0, so we're collapsing the box onto the surface, then uh, this term on the right-hand side goes to 0 this term, this term, this term, and this term goes to zero, and we're just left with these two pieces. All right, delta W cancels, and we finally end up with the tangential component of the electric field in region one is equal to the tangential component of the electric field in region two. So our first boundary condition um, that the electric field must satisfy at the interface between two dielectrics is the tangential components of the electric field are continuous across the interface. So in other words, there's no jump. So the electric field here, just on the region 2 side of this interface, is a, the tangential component of that is exactly the same as the tangential component of the electric field immediately on the region 1 side of this interface. There's no jump. The tangential components are continuous across the interface. Okay, well now let's look at figure 1b here and we're going to come up with another boundary condition. We're going to start from Gauss's law in integral form which looks like this. The flux of D through a surface S is equal to whatever charge is enclosed inside of that surface S. Right. So for this problem I'm going to pick my surface S to be the surface of this pillbox here. Okay, so it's got sides, bottom, and a top. All right, so this is going to be our S, and we're going to apply Gauss's law to this little pillbox. Again, I've, I've played the same game at every point here. I'm resolving the magnetic flux density into a normal and tangential component. That's all these these pictures are, are trying to show you here. Okay, all right, well. So we're going to apply Gauss's law to this little pillbox, and then we're going to allow this dimension to tend towards zero. Okay. Well, if we allow 
if we allow delta H to go to zero, whatever um, component, I should say, whatever contribution to the flux due to the integration over these sides, right, over the sides of the pillbox is going to vanish. So whatever, um, uh, whatever that uh, contribution to the flux there is going to go to zero simply because we're allowing the surface area of the of the sides of the pillbox to go to zero. Okay, so we don't get a contribution to the flux there. The only contribution to the flux we get um, as we let delta H tend to zero are is from the top and from the bottom. Okay, so the contribution to the flux due to the top is represented by this term right here. It's the normal component now, the normal component to the interface times this, this little surface area, the surface area at the top. And then on the bottom, we have um, a negative sign because the surface normal points out there. And we have the normal component of the magnetic flux density in region two times the surface area down here. That's the only two terms that survive from this integration as we allow delta H to tend to zero, okay? On the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, as we're collapsing um, delta H, the volume of this pillbox is going towards zero. So whatever um, contribution to the charge enclosed comes from a volume uh, charge density in here, that goes to zero as well, simply because the volume of the pillbox is going to zero. So the only contribution to the charge that's left is whatever surface charge density is left right here on the interface it's, it's, itself, okay? So as we allow the pillbox to shrink down to zero in terms of the height to go to zero, the only contribution to the charges that are enclosed by the pillbox are due to surface charges right here, surface, uh, surface charge density right on the interface. That term appears here. So the, the only charge enclosed by a pillbox uh, of height zero essentially is the surface charge density times this area delta s. That's it. That's the only th that's the only term that um, survives. And again, if you look at this equation right here, the delta s is cancel out, and we get this boundary condition, which we say the normal component of the electric flux density d is discontinuous by the surface charge density on the interface. Okay. So this is the second boundary condition that. This is essentially a boundary condition on the electric field because um, if we consider a, a linear uh, homogeneous medium, um, the magnetic flux density is just equal to epsilon times the electric field, or I should say the electric flux density, D, is just epsilon E. So really the electric field is hidden in this boundary condition. Okay, So what this is saying is that the, um, the difference between the normal component here, D1n, right on this side of the interface, and whatever D2n is, is equal to the surface charge density. Now, if the surface charge density is equal to zero, then the normal component of the electric flux density, again, is continuous. There will be no, um, no jump. In other words, there won't be any abrupt discontinuity there in the normal component of D if rho sub s is equal to zero, but that's a special case. This is the most general boundary condition that we have to worry about, right? Well, what happens if uh, what happens if one of the regions is a, is a conductor? For instance, a perfect conductor. Really, this should say perfect electrical conductor um, dielectric boundary condition right here. So let's say we've got a PEC, uh, a perfect conductor here in this region, and we've got air out here. Um, if we apply the exact same reasoning that we did before, only set the electric field equal to zero in this region, um, we're going to get uh, two boundary conditions. All right, This one comes from Faraday's law, just like uh, with the exact same development that we went through um, will get you this boundary condition, which says that since this region here is the only region where an electric field can e exist for a perfect electric conductor, what this is simply saying is that on the surface of the conductor, the tangential component of the electric field right here is equal to zero. So one boundary condition that we have on a perfect electric conductor is that the tangential component, this piece of the electric field, on the surface of the conductor is equal to zero. This comes from Faraday's law. Okay? 
And also, if we apply um, the same reasoning to this little pillbox using Gauss's law as we did before, we'll find out that the normal component of the electric flux density is equal to the surface charge density right here, rho sub s, on the surface of a conductor. Okay, so this is these are just really these are just simply special cases of uh, the two more general boundary conditions that we've already already been through, and these hold for um, perfect electrical uh, conductors. Okay, now on to the um, boundary value problem portion of this course. Well, now that we have, um, in the electrostatic case, for instance, we have some governing equations and we have boundary conditions that those governing equations have to solve. And so the goal is to um, satisfy both the governing equations and the boundary conditions. We call that pro those, those solutions, uh, I should say problems where you're asked to do that, those are called boundary value problems. All right? So typically, you'll be given a region of space. And um, again, you'll have to satisfy the, the governing equations everywhere. And you'll have to satisfy the boundary conditions everywhere. If you do that um, because of something called the uniqueness theorem, you're guaranteed to have the one unique solution to that problem. All right? So let's look at an example of a boundary value problem. Let's say we have a spherical shell that, contain, that um, has a uniform surface charge density on the surface, rho sub s. Okay. So there's no, um, there are no charges inside the shell. There are no charges outside the shell. The only charges exist on uh, the sur charge only exists on the surface of the shell right here at r is equal to a. All right. So this is a this is a spherical shell of radius a, and it carries a surface charge density now of rho sub s coulombs per meter squared on the surface right here. Okay. Our task is to find the electric potential created by these charges, both inside and outside of the surface. So inside and outside of the shell. We want to know what is the electric potential V inside and outside of the shell. Okay. Well again we need to uh, start by seeing if we can take advantage of symmetry here and uh, because this this geometry has spherical symmetry we can make the assumption that the electric potential will only be a function of the radial distance r. It's not going to depend on um, theta or phi even though we're going to be in spherical coordinates um, this function will not be a, uh, the potential function will not be a function of theta or phi, just based on symmetry. Okay, So what we need to do is we need to solve the Laplace equation here subject to the two boundary conditions on the electric field that we just talked about. So the tangential component of the electric field on this surface here has to be continuous between the inside and the outside of the shell. All right, So the tangential component of the electric field can't jump. That was our first boundary condition. It's got to be the same across this interface. And then the normal component of the electric flux density inside and outside okay, is going to be discontinuous by this surface charge density rho sub s. All right? Those are the two boundary conditions that we have to satisfy. Let's see how we're going to go about doing that. All right. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're trying to solve Laplace's equation here, all right? And if you, uh, if you look up an expression for the, Lap the scalar Laplacian in spherical coordinates, okay, you're going to get a long, a, a very long expression that involves derivatives with respect to r, theta, and phi, okay? If you look carefully at that expression, the most general expression for the Laplacian in spherical coordinates, you will see that if the unknown potential v is not a function of theta or phi, all those derivatives with respect to theta and phi um, go to zero. So a whole bunch of terms in the scalar Laplacian in spherical coordinates fall out. And what you are left with is just this term right here. Okay? This expression is equal to zero. This is, for our geometry, the um, equation that we need to solve. Okay, it's again. I got this from you would simply look up the expression for the scalar Laplacian, and you would simplify it 
by realizing that those derivatives with respect to theta and phi for this case go to zero. So we have a much simpler equation that we need to solve. This is the Laplacian of V equal to zero. This is Laplace's, Laplace's equation for this case, okay? Okay, well, how are we gonna solve this little equation? Well, we can solve this equation, it turns out, by direct integration. So I'm simply going to integrate both sides of this equation with respect to R, all right? And just do an, in, an indefinite integral here. And so what I'm gonna end up with is when I integrate um, the partial derivative with respect to R of this term in parentheses, what I'm going to get out is simply that term in parentheses here will be equal to some constant, unknown constant C, don't know what it is, okay? I'm gonna play the same game. I'm gonna divide both sides of this equation now by R squared, get this equation, and I'm gonna integrate both sides of this equation with respect to R, and what will come out is a one over R term because the integral of um, one over R squared is proportional to one over R. So I get some unknown constant divided by R from this integration plus another unknown constant because we're doing an indefinite integration, all right? So what this is telling you, and this is extremely important, what this is telling you is that our unknown potential V, which we would like to solve for, has this form. It's equal to some unknown constant A divided by R plus some other unknown constant B. All right, let's examine this solution in two regions. Let's look at this solution in this region, um, R is less than A, and then we'll look at it in the region R is greater than A, okay? When R is less than A, when we're inside the shell here, um, we've got a problem. If we use this most general, select, uh, this most general solution here, when R tends to zero, as when, when R is equal to zero, this potential is going to go to infinity. That's not physical. We can't have um, a, an infinite potential here at the origin. So what we have to do is we have to set A equal to zero for, um, for when the potential is, uh, I should say, when R is less than A, when we're in this region. So the, uh, the form of our solution looks like this when R is less than A. The potential is equal to some unknown constant B when we're in this region, all right? And that's simply because we can't have an infinite potential here at the origin, all right? We have a very similar problem um, when we consider the solution for R greater than A, in other words, when we're out here, okay? If we look at this general solution, this term doesn't pose a problem. As R tends toward infinity, this term will go to zero. However, if we have a constant term B out here, that term never goes to zero as R tends to infinity. That's also not physical. Far away from the, um, from the charged shell, the potential has to be, be going to zero. So outside in this region, we have to set this constant B to be zero, okay? So the, um, we have, we have uh, a solution, a proposed solution for the potential, and it looks different depending on the region we're in. When R is between zero and A, the potential is equal to some constant B. I don't know what that constant is. Um, we have to solve for that. Uh, when R is greater than or equal to A, the potential is equal to some other unknown constant that I don't know divided by R, right? Now, how do we figure out what this unknown constant B is and what this unknown constant A is? The answer to that question is we have to apply boundary conditions, okay? Remember, we have two boundary conditions on the electric field that we need to deal with. Um, the first one is, again, uh, the continuity of the tangential electric field at R is equal to A. So again, the tangential components for this uh, uh, coordinate system, the tangential components will be the theta and the phi components of the electric field. Those have to be continuous across this interface, okay? It works out that, well, first of all, remember that for the electrostatic case, we can get the electric field from this unknown potential that we're trying to solve by taking the gradient of that potential and multiplying by negative one, all right? You can satisfy yourself that if you take the gradient of this potential that just depends on R, okay, um, 
And if you say that the tangential components of the electric field have to be continuous across this interface, then that implies that um, the potential itself has to be continuous across this interface. Okay, So I'd encourage you, as an exercise, take the gradient of our unknown potential um, in spherical coordinates and convince yourself that if the potential is continuous across this interface, the theta and phi components of the electric field will also be continuous. Okay, So our first boundary condition is that this potential V is continuous across this interface. In other words, V just inside the shell is equal to V just outside of the shell, basically. Okay. All right, well, we also have a second um, boundary condition on the electric flux density, remember, which is that the normal component of the electric flux density at the interface is discontinuous by the surface charge density Okay, at that interface. All right. So those are the two boundary conditions um, that we have to uh, enforce in order to find our unknown constants A and B. Well, let's look at the form of the electric field um, in each region. All right. If you'll recall, when we're um, inside the shell, we're saying that our potential is simply equal to some constant B. All right. If I plug that, the form of that equation in here, and I take the derivative of it with respect to R, I find that the R component of my electric field is equal to zero when I'm inside of the shell. Right? Uh, when I uh, examine the form of the solution here for the potential when R is greater than small a, if I take the derivative of this guy with respect to R, multiply it by negative one to get the R component, I find that the R component of the electric field um, looks like this when we're outside of the sphere. Okay, so, uh, and I got these two expressions simply by substituting my, my, my trial solutions into this equation, which since we're only interested in the R component in this case, just boils down to this. All right, The R component of the electric field is minus the partial derivative of the potential with respect to R. So I got this and this from this equation and my trial solutions for each region. All right. Well, let's go ahead and apply boundary conditions here and see if we can figure out what A and B are. All right. So I, I, the first boundary condition I need to enforce, like I said, is that the potential itself is the same at this point, basically. In other words, it's continuous across this interface. So the potential when R is less than then a is equal to my constant b, if you remember. Okay, and my potential when r is greater than a is equal to capital A over r. So in order to enforce that boundary condition at r equals little a, I just simply simply substitute in for r equals little a in my equation. So the potential outside is equal to the potential inside on the boundary. That's the first equation. All right. Now we have to apply um, the boundary condition that says the, the normal component of the electric flux density is discontinuous by the surface charge density at r is equal to a for this problem. Okay, And so that equation boils down to this. Remember, the r component of the electric field looks like this outside, a over r squared. And so to enforce this at the boundary, I put r equal to little a. All right. The R component, which is the normal component of the electric field inside, is equal to zero. So a zero goes there. And remember, um, the boundary condition is on the electric flux density, not the electric uh, field. So I have to multiply by the permittivity on the left-hand side. And the boundary condition says the difference between, again, the normal component of the, the electric flux density outside and the normal component of the electric flux density inside is it has to be equal to my surface charge density rho sub s. Right? So now we have um, a system of two equations and two unknowns here and we can solve this one really really easily for capital A in terms of epsilon naught little a in rho sub s and then substitute back in here to get capital B. And when we do that it works out that our un unknown coefficient capital A is rho sub s little a squared divided by epsilon naught and 
our unknown coefficient capital B is rho sub s little a divided by epsilon naught. Now to complete the solution I can go back to my proposed solution here for the potential and I can substitute B in here now I know what the potential is when R is less than or equal to A and I can substitute A right in here now I know what the potential is when um, R is greater than or equal to A okay well let's uh, look at an example of of the plots of these uh, of this potential and and the normal component of the magnetic flux density okay as a function of R all right as a function of R so on this axis here basically this is my R axis and I've just normalized it by my radius a so um, from 0 to 1 this is when we are inside we're inside the shell and you can see the potential is equal to my constant B there it is for this geometry all right, it's constant so long as we're inside the shell as soon as we move outside of the shell the potential begins to fall off like 1 over R right we have A over R out here, okay? And if you'll notice, at the boundary, the potential is continuous, right? There's no jump. Literally, literally, it's continuous, right? Just like from, from the definition of, of continuity that you learned in Calc 1, all right? There's no break. There's no jump. The potential is continuous there across the boundary. Now, let's look at the R component of the electric flux density and see what it's doing, all right? Well, remember inside we decided that the R component of the electric field and therefore the R component of the electric flux density was equal to zero so here we are inside the shell E sub R is equal to zero and then outside the shell the electric field falls off like 1 over R squared and we saw that in the form of the the um, electric field when R is greater than equal greater than or equal to A all right and we said we have a boundary condition here. This is, this is when R is equal to little a, right? This is the boundary between the inside and the outside. And we said that the magnetic or the electric flux density was going to be discontinuous there, all right? In other words, there was going to be a jump. So this one, continuous, no jump. Here, we've got a jump. And that jump, the amount of that jump, the boundary condition said, has to be equal to our surface charge density. So the difference between this point and this point is equal to rho sub s. And if, if you look at this, um, this, uh, this axis actually has units of coulombs per meter uh, squared. All right, So this actually has a, the units of surface charge density, if you want to think about that. And this is 1 times 10 to the negative 8. That is the rho s that I put into the code to make this these plots. So what you're seeing here is a, is a graphic illustration of, of the two boundary conditions um, that we have on, on the electric field. This one says that the, con the, the uh, potential has to be continuous inside and outside, and this one says that the normal component, the electric flux density, has to be discontinuous at the boundary by exactly this amount, rho sub s. Well, that concludes um, this lecture. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next one.